So it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you about what most people, I think, think of as the greatest biography ever written, James Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson. What you see here are some books from the collection of Terry Seymour, who's here with us today. Uh, Terry is one of the great Boswell book collectors and the author of Boswell's Books, which is the best study of the books that Boswell had in his library. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this first is to show you uh, the first edition of Boswell's Life of Johnson as it looked bound in the 18th century, or as it might have looked, depending on the binding that was used. That's on the far left in two volumes. You see how tall it is, how great it is. It's a quarto. And uh, I know that here at the Rare Book School, there's a lot done on formats of different, different kinds of formats. Well, that's a quarto. In the middle of the picture, the three volumes there, the second edition of The Life of Johnson, that's an octavo. Smaller, less expensive, uh, almost like what was done at least until recently when a book would come out first in hardback and then a few years later in a cheaper paperback edition, something like that. And the other one that I want to mention here is the book on the far right, which is Boswell's uh, Journal of a Tour to the Hebrides with Samuel Johnson, which came out in 1785. That's a one-volume octavo. Uh, just to give you an idea, that cost six shillings. As we'll see, Boswell's first edition of The Life of Johnson cost 42 shillings, seven times as much. So it's, there's a big difference in the way that these books are uh, structured and the, the price points and the kind of audience they, uh, they go for. Uh, Michael alluded to this book, which came out uh, in 2023, uh, and I'll actually be speaking to this, and if anyone is interested enough to pick up a copy, there are no royalties, so I don't stand to uh, get anything from this particular uh, book financially, but it will uh, contain more information if you're interested. You'll see from the subtitle that uh, it has two theses, one of which uh, is that Boswell was the author and publisher of The Life of Johnson, something that isn't too well known. Uh, the other is that he had a support network, which was very prominent and helped him tremendously to pull it off. And uh, I'll be talking mainly about that first point, the author-publisher aspect of things. Well, let me begin with a very general question. How can we, can we learn about 18th century books? The first item there, the first type of evidence that uh, we, we have is something that's very familiar to everyone here at the Rare Book School, the books themselves, bibliography, analytical and descriptive bibliography. Looking at the book, you can find out so much about it. Uh, however, I'm not a bibliographer. I am a historian. And what I'm interested in particularly is the way that uh, not only the evidence from the books themselves, but also these other kinds of evidence can be found and used. And it's kind of surprising that in all these years, most of this, especially what I've highlighted at the bottom, uh, or particularly what I've uh, highlighted at the bottom, has not been exploited very much or even at all in some of the cases that I'll be talking about. So correspondence, uh, journals, diaries, and memoirs, newspaper advertisements, extremely important. Uh, and then these book trade documents that I've highlighted, printing ledgers, sales records, booksellers' catalogs and advertisements, and especially impression accounts. I wonder how many people have seen impression accounts. We're going to see one at the end from the first edition of The Life of uh, Johnson. Uh, an impression account is much more than a printing ledger. It's an account of all the components that went into the making of a book and what they cost. And it's quite extraordinary that one exists for this book. And equally extraordinary, I think, that uh, very little has been done on, on that, uh, on that uh, uh, impression account uh, until I tried to do it recently. So the bottom point, uh, what's, I think, unique about, uh, as far as I know, unique about the life of Johnson with regard to these uh, forms of evidence is that all of them exist in regard to this book, and some of them are really plentiful. So in the talk today, I'm going to be mentioning examples of every one of these forms of evidence, and you'll see what I mean about their prevalence and their importance. Okay, here's the book. It's, a, it's not the best um, 
picture, I'm afraid, but here is the title page of the first edition. Came out in 1791, that's the Roman numeral down there at the bottom, which I've uh, blown up on the top right. London, printed by Henry Baldwin, Baldwin for Charles Dilley in the poultry, which is just a section of a street in London. Uh, and then on the left side, uh, as you're looking at it, the frontispiece portrait of Samuel Johnson uh, that was uh, engraved by James Heath from a portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds. Now the evidence uh, that we find in books is sometimes correct and sometimes it's false. And in this case, there's an element here that I'm highlighting that is false, and that is that the book was published or rather printed for Charles Dilley. That's the way that 18th century books referred to publishers. It was printed by such and such, that was the printer. It was printed for someone, that was the publisher. But in this case, the real publisher, as I said, is Boswell. And uh, being the author and the publisher uh, did a number of things, but one of the things that's particularly important from our point of view, from my point of view, is that bottom point that this gave Boswell access to records and materials that an author normally would not have access to. And Boswell was a, was a pack rat and he kept those things and there, a lot of them are found uh, today in the Beinecke Library at Yale University. We'll be seeing some of them as we go along. Okay, a little background for those of you who haven't been thinking about James Boswell lately. Uh, those are his dates up on the top. Uh, in 1763, when he's a young man of 22, he goes to London, he meets Samuel Johnson, who at that time is a renowned man of letters in London, famous for writing the first really big, successful dictionary of the English language, essays, novels, all kinds of things, and particularly famous as a conversationalist. And then Boswell goes on the grand tour, grand tour for a couple of years in Europe. Then he comes back, and from 1766 until the mid-'80s, for about 20 years, he practices law in Edinburgh, and during that time, he visits London almost every year. I think every year in that period except five. And he spends as much time as he can with Samuel Johnson. He records Johnson's conversation uh, in uh, notebooks, and he joins Johnson's circle of friends. He joins the famous literary club, or the club as it was called. Uh, and then he publishes a book of his own called An Account of Corsica, based on his grand tour experiences and opting for Corsican independence. And this begins his relationship with Charles and Edward Dilley, publishers in, in London. Uh, and uh, Edward eventually dies in 1779, but Charles continues as Boswell's uh, bookseller and great friend. In, and this also gives Boswell uh, a name as an author. Uh, in 1769, he marries Margaret Montgomery. He has uh, five children with her. Uh, unfortunately, she was sick with consumption, or what we would call tuberculosis, and uh, she uh, uh, has a difficult time of it and um, dies in, in, in 1789 before The Life of Johnson comes out. In 1773, uh, Boswell succeeds in getting Johnson to come to Scotland and go on a tour of, uh, of Scotland, ending up in the Hebrides, and that will be the basis of the book that I mentioned before, the Journal of a Tour to the Hebrides with Samuel Johnson, that comes out 12 years later. In 1782, Boswell succeeds as the laird, or uh, that's the Scottish term for uh, uh, someone who, is in, who owns an estate, the laird of Auchinleck in Ayrshire in Scotland, after his father uh, dies. And uh, so he then receives the, uh, the money from the farmers who live on the estate. There are quite a few of them. But there were problems of various kinds, and he was in lots of debt, as we'll see. And uh, so financially, he, uh, he never was, uh, he, he was always struggling, I guess you could say. And then in 1784, in Edinburgh, he gets word that Johnson has just died. He's stunned. He doesn't know what to do. He faces several problems, and he also has several advantages, and that's what I'm looking at here. The problems concern competition. There are lots of people writing uh, biographies of Johnson at the time, something like six or eight. But the two that he's most worried about are Johnson's old friend, uh, Mrs. Piozzi, as she's called after she remarries and kind of splits with Johnson, uh, who comes out with a book about Johnson in 1786, and Sir John Hawkins, who was one of Johnson's uh, executors, 
who published his Life of Johnson in 1787, both in octavo format. I think that's important uh, because Boswell, remember, is going for a quarto, and that's a kind of a statement about how important he thinks his book is. Uh, Boswell is also in debt, so he has challenging financial circumstances. He's limited in some ways by what he knows about Johnson. After all, he has those notebooks from the times he's been in London with Johnson, and also, of course, the time in, time in Scotland. But that doesn't amount to much in terms of the time of Johnson's life. What about the first 53 years of Johnson's life before Boswell even knew him? Uh, what about uh, the times of all through the year when Boswell is in, in London? Uh, so there's a lot of information he doesn't have. He's far from London. And then, very important, Boswell suffers from what we today I would call, I think, bipolar disorder. He described it himself by saying he had alternate agitation and depression of spirits to which I am unhappily subject. Uh, and we'll see how that affects the, uh, the construction of the book in my interpretation. On the other hand, he has these advantages. What I mentioned, he's, he has a journal filled with conversation that he's had with Johnson over the years. And he has this support network uh, that I alluded to earlier, Johnson's close friends, his his friend Edwin Malone, who becomes Boswell's editor, and uh, his printer, Henry Baldwin, and his bookseller, Charles Dilley, who, uh, again, as I alluded to, become uh, not only uh, the book trade members who work with him, but really his very close friends. They're intimate friends, especially Dilley. Uh, and then we can't, uh, we can't uh, uh, play short, I think, on Johnson's uh, sorry, Boswell's ability to put all of this together into a book, Boswell's Genius, which um, is a very important part of his success. I mentioned before and showed you on the far right of the opening picture, Boswell's Journal of a Tour to the Hebrides. Now, what happens was right after Johnson dies at the, in December 1784, uh, Boswell uh, is encouraged by Charles Dilley to put out his biography, but he says, no, uh, he, he's not going to do that. Instead, he's just going to publish first this one volume uh, journal of a tour to the Hebrides with Johnson. For one thing, he could get it out quickly, which he does. It's out by the end of the year in 1785, in October 1785. Uh, for another thing, it's uh, the first time that Dilly uh, lets Boswell uh, be the publisher, in effect. In other words, Boswell's taking all the risk and getting all the profit. And Dilly is appearing in the title page as if he's the publisher, but he's really just taking a, a, commission, a commission. He's taking a cut, but nothing more. And uh, finally, very importantly, at the end of the uh, Journal of the Tour to the Hebrides, Boswell puts in this notice that's on the right here, preparing for the press in one volume quarto. It ends up in two, but at this time he thought it was going to be one volume. The Life of Samuel Johnson. And in this, he talks about how he's been working on the book for 20, the life of Johnson for 20 years. He was Johnson's friend. Johnson, in effect, uh, authorized it uh, because he was well informed of his design, as he says. He communicated to him several curious particulars. Uh, and very importantly, in that fourth line there, he says that his ambition is to erect a literary monument to Johnson, one of the very important aspects of the book is that it's going to be uh, extremely complementary to Johnson, as opposed to the two books I mentioned before, both of which are quite critical in some ways, and uh, at least Johnson's friends didn't feel that they were complementary enough. And Boswell sets out to uh, rectify that. So he goes on and talks about other things he's done. And then in 1786, or other things he's planning to do, I should say, and then in 1786, he makes what is from a physical point of view, I guess, the biggest move of his life. He moves from Edinburgh, where he's been all of his life, to London. And in fact, he only goes back to Edinburgh one time for a few days in the last 10 years of his life, after he makes this move. Uh, he moves to London mainly to write the life of Johnson, but he also is trying to switch uh, his law jobs from the Edinburgh bar to the London bar and it was not a good move. He was in his 40s. It was almost like starting over again as a barrister uh, rather than an advocate, which are the terms that were used in the law profession at the time. Uh, so it was 
not a good idea from that point of view. It was a bad idea from the point of view of his wife, who did poorly in the uh, bad era of London, eventually moved back to Auchinleck, where she spent her last years and died um, isolated from uh, Boswell in, in, in 1789. But it was a good idea for, the, for one point, which was so important to Boswell, writing the life of Johnson. He now had his friends, he had his sources, he had Johnson's friends, he went to them, and the book continues to expand. Now, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, last uh, aver little advertisement I showed you was 1785. Now, two years later, Dilly puts out a catalog of books. And remember, this is another one of those sources I mentioned. Uh, a catalog of books, and in the back of the catalog of books is an advertisement for Boswell's Life of Johnson. The first paragraph on your left will look familiar to you because it's just the same thing he had put in at the end of the Journal of to the tour, uh, to, uh, a journal of a tour to the Hebrides, and on the right he had some other uh, information. It's again going to be a literary monument, but I think that there's a contradiction here, which is typical of Boswell. At the beginning of it, at the top, he says it's it's in the press. This is in 1787. It won't come out for four more years. It's nowhere near being in the press. It's just being written, and he's he's you know it's it's just a lie. But it's the kind of thing Boswell would do to promote his books. And then he contradicts himself at the end of that advertisement by saying that he'd be much obliged for more information, more letters. Uh, well, how can you do that if it's in the press? Um, so he, he's, re he's really just trying to promote the book and tell everyone that this is coming and get, build up anticipation. Now, he's got to make a lot of decisions. Some of these are the kinds of decisions that an author makes when writing a book always. But in this case, the final decision rests with Boswell as the publisher. And that's not typical of books in the 18th century or really of almost any other time. Is it going to, what's the format going to be? He's already decided on a quarto. He's announced that. And as I said before, this states that the book is going to be very important, that Johnson is an important figure, that his biography is an important biography. Uh, and, the, and I think the format speaks that kind of language. How many volumes? We've seen two advertisements from 1785 and 1787 in which Boswell said it was going to be a one volume quarto, but it ends up in two as the text keeps expanding, as he keeps acquiring more and more information and more and more material. Typeface, paper, uh, he, he, there's material that I uh, talk about a little in the, in the little book I, uh, I showed you. Uh, he ends up using a um, pica uh, typeface, which is smaller than the one they'd set out to use, and he ends up using fine medium paper, which is larger than the paper he'd set out to use, in order to get more on the page and get more into the book. Illustrations, is it going to have copper plate engravings? Uh, as we'll see, those are very expensive. He decides ultimately on having three, one of which we've seen, and in fact, that's the only one I'm going to mention. There's another one that's very important that I've written about elsewhere, and then there's one that I don't think is as important at the end of the book. But we'll see that once you make that decision, you're going with illustrations, you've got problems that you have to uh, work out to make that, them uh, work in the book. Is it going to have an index? When Boswell sets out to write the book, no. But as he moves along, he makes the decision to have an index and to place it at the beginning of the book, before volume one, instead of at the end of volume two. And the main reason for that was that volume two was getting bigger and bigger. Not only had it expanded into a two volume work, but volume two, where he was getting most of his information about Johnson's later life, and where he had more material anyway from his own experiences with Johnson, was getting very, very long. So one of the reasons he puts the index before volume one is to balance the size of the volumes. Number of copies to print. As the publisher, he makes this decision. 1,750 of a two-volume quarto. That's huge. Tremendous number. And remember, this is all at Boswell's risk. What's the price going to be? Well, that's pretty much set by uh, the standards of the day. If it's going to be a big two-volume quarto, two guineas or 42 shillings, two pounds, two shillings, those all say the same thing in the language of 18th century money, uh, that's going to uh, be the price. And that's a lot of money. Only someone very wealthy could afford that. And the, retail, the wholesale price is going to be 32 shillings. So there's a 10 shilling differential there, which is the profit that an individual bookseller would make to sell a retail copy.
Boswell is going to get those 42 shillings from selling uh, each copy to the trade. Number of copies to give away. Well, because he's the publisher, he can give away as many copies as he wants. And I refer you again to Terry Seymour's book, Boswell's Books, which goes into great depth about how many copies he kept and where they ended up and all the things that Terry has found out. Uh, but he decides that he's going to keep 52 books, which he's going to give as presentation copies to friends or people who helped him on the book or to family, or he's going to keep some of those for himself. And then nine copies he's going to give to Stationers Hall, which, are going to, which is a way of registering the book. Uh, and those nine copies are going to be in sheets. They're not going to be bound in any way. But the 52 copies, most of them anyway, are going to be uh, in boards. And I'll explain what that means in a, in a few minutes, although many of you from the Rare Book School know more about it than I do. So uh, with, with 61 copies, 52 plus 9, out of 1,750, he has 1,689 copies to sell, which is a lot of copies. And then finally, newspaper advertising. He has to make decisions about how much to advertise, where he advertises extensively in London, as we'll see, but also in Edinburgh. And each one of these decisions is a decision that affects not only how the book looks, how it reads, but also how much it's going to cost, how much risk he's taking. I mentioned before that Boswell's psychological state uh, can be looked at uh, in regard to the way that the book proceeds. And that's what I'm going to uh, argue here. He has a period in, uh, through most of the 17, uh, year 1790 where I would say he's, in, well, I said exalted. Uh, we might also say manic uh, would be the way that he uh, is during that, that time. It's then that he decides on using more expensive paper, on printing 1,750 copies, on expanding the text until it must be two volumes. In other words, he's taking more and more risk. And during this period, as he's doing this, uh, a bookseller in London by the name of George Robinson uh, indicates through his friend Malone that he's willing to buy the copyright for 1,000 pounds. That's a lot of money. But Boswell, in this period when he's uh, quite uh, up, riding high, as I say, uh, won't hear of it. And he, he writes a letter in which he says, I am a bold man to have refused a cool thousand, but my work may be called a view of literature and literary men in Great Britain for half a century. So now he's not only uh, writing a biography of a great man and uh, trying to uh, erect a literary monument to him, but he's also talking about his book as a cultural history, really, or literary history of the period. And I think that's very important. That actually goes into the title of the book, language very similar to that. He then buys an expensive piece of land that he absolutely cannot afford, knock room, uh, buys it and uh, mortgages uh, most of the land. He has to borrow money to do it. It's, he later realizes how stupid it was, but when he's riding high, he doesn't really, uh, he's not really capable of uh, reining himself in. And then at the beginning of 1791, he has a panic attack. I mean, there's no other name for it, really. The word anxiety, which is a great 18th century word, we think of it as a, as a word of our time, but really uh, in the 18th century, it's used a lot, and Boswell uses it and says that in his letters now that he has tremendous anxiety about this. I've given three examples, uh, and I won't read all of them, but notice that uh, a friend writes to Malone, who's in Dublin at the time, poor Boswell is very low and dispirited and almost melancholy mad. He was now beginning to doubt himself and wondering, why didn't I accept that thousand pounds? He writes to, he writes to uh, Malone in Dublin, could I still get that thousand pounds? You know, is it, you think I could still do that deal? He is really beside himself and terrified. And then he begins to get some loans, including from Baldwin and Dilly, his printer and his bookseller, who were always loyal to him, willing to lend him money on a, on a dime, really, or who we would call a dime, they would call a shilling. Uh, and, um, and he begins to steady himself. And in those last couple of months before publication in May 1791, he decides, I'm going to stick with self-publication. And you know, he forges ahead. So we see him going through these stages, uh, very much linked to his mental state. OK, the book comes out on 16 May 1791. Two days earlier, on the 14th, this advertisement appears in the London papers. And I promised you a, a newspaper advertisement. Here it is. Look at how much information 
is in that advertisement. The date of publication, the number of volumes, the format, it's a quarto, uh, the price, two guineas in boards, and we'll see what boards mean in the next slide. Uh, the dedication to Sir Joshua Reynolds, his great friend, and also the painter of that uh, portrait of Johnson, Johnson's great friend as well. Uh, the illustrations, mentioning uh, what they are, but particularly uh, drawing attention to James Heath's uh, engraving of Johnson in the frontispiece. The full title of the book, which as I mentioned now, uh, includes language about it being a view of literature and literary men in Great Britain for near half a century. Um, something more than just a biography. The ostensible publisher, Charles Dilley, even though Boswell's really the publisher. And then uh, towards, the, uh, the, towards the end of that part of the advertisement, uh, he talks about uh, why it's taken so long for the book to come out. Uh, additional information, authentic manuscripts, and singular anecdotes of Dr. Johnson have been coming in, and he's been adding them mainly to the second volume. So that's the 14th of May. And here is how the book looked in boards. If you went into a bookshop, if you went into Dilly's bookshop or any other bookshop in London in 1791 after the book had come out, this is more or less how you would see it. It's this uh, pre-fancy pre, uh, binding kind of uh, uh, binding, uh, which has only labels, which I've blown up on the right, that tell you the name of the book, the title of the book, uh, that it's in two volumes quarto, which volume it is, and the price, two guineas, 42 shillings. And that's the way it would look. Uh, it was understood that for someone wealthy enough to buy a book like that in quarto, they would then be going out and going to a book binder and getting it bound in whatever way they chose. And it would then be able to go into their library. So when it was bound, it might look like that or like the, the, the book that I showed you in the very first slide on the far left. Uh, but when you actually went into the retail shop, it looked like the previous slide in boards. All right, I promised you a letter from Boswell. On 13 May 1791, which is three days before publication, Boswell writes a letter to a friend in Scotland. And he talks about what he's doing. The book has been fairly launched, he says. It's going to come out on Monday. And although it's very expensive, he has no reason to be discouraged. He talks about how many uh, booksellers have purchased the book that day, and that, uh, uh, and that a total of uh, upwards of 400 have been sold on this very first day of the pre-publication sale. He talks about other possible places where it could sell. And then in the last line, I am, as you may suppose, very busy at my booksellers. Well, an ordinary author would not be at his booksellers for a pre-publication sale to the book trade. This was just members of the book trade in London who were coming to Dilly's shop and were buying wholesale copies. Boswell was there because he was the publisher. And so he was hobnobbing with the, uh, the booksellers and. Uh, we can just imagine what a, a dynamic scene it was. And notice there, he says that one bookseller uh, came in the morning and uh, bought uh, a certain number of copies, say 20, 20 copies, he says, 20 sets, and then comes back for 10 more in the afternoon because those were sold. Now, by sold, he doesn't mean they were delivered to customers because the pub official publication date wasn't until the 16th. But he means that uh, the, uh, the people had come into the shops and said, I want to buy a copy, and they had signed up for it, and now uh, the bookseller in question would come back and get more copies. He'd be busy having his people put them in boards over the weekend because he'd be taking them in sheets from, the, uh, from Dilly's shop, and then over that weekend they'd be putting them in boards, and then when the customer came back on Monday morning, the 16th, and the book officially went on sale, uh, he'd be able to pick it up, or she would be able to pick it up in boards, just the way we saw before, and then think about having it bound. Boswell kept a record of the sales. It's quite extraordinary. It goes on and on for something like 13 months. And he says it's a subscription 
Now, he's not using subscription in the usual way that we think of, say, when a book is uh, advertised and then when a certain number of people sign up for it, then it's published. Uh, he's using it in a, in a way to mean that the book trade, members of the book trade, booksellers, are coming to Dilly's shop and subscribing. They're signing up for it at the wholesale price. And he writes there what the wholesale price is. is for two shillings more, you can have it uh, stored at Dilly's warehouse at one pound 14 shillings. But the, the base numbers are one pound 12 shillings or 32 shillings wholesale and two pounds two shillings or two guineas 42 shillings for, um, for it in boards uh, as the retail price. And as I note down the bottom and said before, that means that if you're a bookseller in London, uh, in a shop, if you're one of those people on the right who's come in for six copies or 12 copies or whatever it might be, uh, you will then make uh, 10 shillings on each copy you sell minus the cost of putting it in boards, which wouldn't be that much. So that's a pretty large amount of money uh, to make on a particular book. And you notice the numbers here. There's one bookseller, Rob, the Robinsons, the Robinson family, uh, about six down or so. Uh, the one who had offered Boswell a thousand pounds for the copyright, he comes in and takes 50 right away. And other people here uh, take, a, take quite a few. Robinson ended up uh, taking, I think, something like 215 copies, uh, which is uh, quite a lot. So we have this record this running account that Boswell himself has kept, and that's at the Beinecke Library at Yale, though nothing has been done with it for some reason until uh, recently. Um, and what this shows is that on the first day of the sale, which is the, the 12th and 13th, with for, for some reason he considered the first day, um, 431 copies were sold at the wholesale price. Uh, 506 were sold by the time the book went on sale on the 16th. That's a lot of copies. So now the book trade in London was armed with uh, copies which they could put in boards and customers could come in and buy it and, uh, and take it home and then have it bound. And Boswell writes in a letter on 22 August 1791 that 1,200 copies out of the 1,689 that were for sale, 1,200 of them had been sold by that time. Uh, this is quite extraordinary, I think. 95% of those 1,689 copies that were for sale can be accounted for because of Boswell keeping these records and sometimes sending letters talking about and, and keeping other, uh, having other kinds of, of records of what was going on with the sale. Uh, and you see that about 91% of them are to the London book trade. Dilly himself had uh, sold 51 copies in his shop, retail copies. Boswell marked those as single. That was the word he used in, those, uh, in, in the lists of sales that were being made. Uh, but you see, most of them were not being sold in Dilly's shop. They were being sold in, in other shops. And then uh, relatively few went out to other towns and to even just 52 to Boswell's hometown of Edinburgh, even though they advertised there, uh, where Johnson was not the most popular person in the world because he was so prejudiced against the Scots. Uh, but uh, in any case, it, it shows, I think, the total dominance of the London book trade. My guess, I, I think it's more than a guess, but I don't have hard evidence for it, is that uh, many of these London booksellers who were taking many copies, certainly the Robinsons, uh, were wholesaling the book elsewhere. Because, they had a, because he had a 10 shilling differential for each copy, that's enough so that he could sell it, Rob, George Robinson could sell it to somebody in some other town uh, for uh, less and still take a profit that was pretty good. Robinson was considered the, the king of wholesalers, as they called him. And uh, I think that, that in itself uh, indicates that that's probably what he was doing. He wasn't selling uh, all those uh, 200 and something copies that he, that he purchased uh, out of his shop, in other words. But one way or the other, they're getting sold. So this goes on from May 1791 until the end of November 1792. And on the 24th of November 1792, after the book's been out for a year and a half, Boswell writes this in his journal. This was the day fixed by Mr. Dilly for settling my accounts with me and Mr. Baldwin. 
as to the quarto edition of my life of Dr. Johnson, etc. I was somewhat animated by the prospect and walked pretty briskly to my worthy booksellers, where I had a hearty breakfast, after which he produced to me the clear produce of the sale exclusive of presents amounting to 1,555 pounds, 18 shillings, two pence. That's a lot of money. This was flattering to me as an author. Now, Boswell was in such debt that he actually uh, didn't get to enjoy that money very much, but it was still a much better deal than if he had accepted 1,000 pounds for the copyright, for three reasons. First of all, it's more profit in itself. Secondly, Boswell still owned the copyright. So when the second edition and later editions came out, he could profit from those. And third, Boswell could never have taken 52 copies for his friends and his own use if he had sold the copyright. You just, you don't, any of you who've published a book know you don't get that many copies from your publisher. Uh, but being the publisher himself, he could take as many copies as he wanted, and he did. So now what we have to do is figure out how Dilly got to that very flattering figure of 1,555 pounds and uh, 18 shillings and two pits. And now we get to that impression account that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. When Boswell meets with Dilly on, in November 1792, Dilly presents him with this, this, this impression account, which Boswell then kept among his papers and has survived. It's a three-page document, and I'm going to uh, take you through it. I won't have time, I think, to go into uh, depth on every aspect of it, but I'll, I'll take you through the, uh, some of the uh, key aspects of it. On the first page and part of the second page, Dilly lists the various people to whom Boswell gave those 52 copies, presentation copies, various friends, and you see the one to the king, which, Boswell, which uh, Dilly has highlighted in bold letters. Uh, I've underlined a couple of Boswell's very close friends, like Sir Joshua Reynolds and Edmund Malone. Uh, all the friends received copies in boards, so Boswell has also had to pay for boarding those copies, as well as the loss of the copies themselves. So here it is, 61 copies. That's 52 that he gave to his friends and kept for himself, and nine that went to Stationers Hall in sheets. And that leaves 1,689 copies which by this time, a year and a half after publication, had all been sold at the wholesale price of 32 shillings, one pound, 12 shillings, to uh, the amount of 2,702 pounds, eight shillings. All of that money belongs to Boswell as the publisher. What does Dilly get? Well, what Dilly gets is what's at the bottom of that page, commissioned seven and a half percent for all the work that he did in organizing the sale and uh, putting the book together, dealing with the printing, the paper, well, really doing all the jobs of publisher, what Dilly got was a, was a percentage, 7.5% of that 2,702 and change uh, pounds. So that's still a lot of money, 202 pounds plus, uh, but it's nothing like what uh, Boswell is going to get as the publisher. Also at the bottom of that document, what we see is that Dilly has put the total amount that Boswell owed in expenses, 943 pounds, 16 shillings, four pence. It's very hard to put all of this into modern uh, money, you know, when you're wondering, you know, how much is that? But it, it, we're certainly talking about uh, $150,000, $200,000 today, something like that. If, if Boswell had been told, being the way he was in terms of his mental state, if Boswell had been told a couple of weeks earlier, earlier, well, this is going to cost you 943 pounds plus my commission. If Dilly had told him that, Boswell would have gone through the roof. But when Dilly presents it, all the copies have been sold. So he's still coming out with a, a very large profit. And on a separate sheet of paper is the information below here. The wholesale profit minus the combination of Dilly's commission and uh, the various expenses, which we're going to see in a minute, comes to uh, that figure, that very flattering figure of 1,555 pounds, 18 shillings, two pence. Now, page three of the impression account. This is an itemization of all the money that Boswell owes. Uh, what I have on the left there is not exact 
I've sort of put things in categories and summarized it to make it a little easier. And also, I don't have the columns done very well. They didn't come out in proper order. But if you see three, three columns, uh, that means there's pence. It's, it's pounds, shillings, and pence. If you see only two, it means it's shillings and pence. First thing on the top is the paper. And the astonishing thing about the paper is how much it costs. Look at how much the paper costs as opposed to the printing. The printing is about 286 pounds. The paper is about 500 and almost 53 pounds. And that's typical in the 18th century. Paper, after all, was not yet, didn't come from trees at this time. It came from linen, a manufactured product, and was very expensive. And uh, it, it was um, uh, much more expensive than the, the, than the cost of, uh, of printing itself. So then we see uh, Henry Baldwin's charge for printing. Baldwin also had a, had a separate account, uh, which Boswell received, which I'll show you in the next slide, though we won't go into any depth about it. But um, uh, this summarizes uh, what Baldwin had charged for the printing, 251 pounds plus some change, and then extra printing for corrections, for the index, for other things like that, 35 pounds. And the next set of charges are the engravings. Remember I mentioned there were three engravings, one of which was the frontispiece portrait of Johnson that you saw. Well, that came to over 80 pounds, which is a lot of money, thousands of dollars, uh, that Boswell uh, had to pay for all of these engravings. They're not proportional. Heath's engraving of uh, Johnson's head is 47 pounds, five shillings, a lot of money. Actually, Heath went through several stages in doing this. Uh, there's a great story about it, which I won't go into, about uh, how Reynolds, uh, the painter of the portrait itself, and Boswell went to see uh, Heath and encouraged him to make Johnson look more distinguished and older in the portrait, and that's what he did. But it's a, Heath gets a lot of money, and he's praised in the newspaper ad that I mentioned before. But the other two engravings are basically just line engravings. And the engraver of both of those, a man named Henry Shepard, gets only five guineas, five pounds, five shillings, for doing both of them. Because it doesn't, they didn't take the kind of artistry that doing that portrait of Johnson did. They were just line engravings. And then there's much more to it than that. There's, there's the working of the engravings. You, once the, the, uh, the copper has been uh, engraved, then somebody, a copper plate engraver, William Hinton or John Smith, has to uh, take that copper plate and work it, uh, as it was called, and, uh, and actually uh, move, put it through a copper plate press. And that was uh, especially costly for the engravings of Johnson, uh, 19 and a half pounds for doing that. You'll notice that Hinton, worked or was, uh, was char charged for working 1,950 heads, but only 1,750 copies had been printed. So that means that uh, 200 copies of Johnson's portrait existed as prints that were sold separately or something. I've never been able to find out anything about them. Uh, but Boswell owned them. That's all we know. 200 more than, were, than, than copies of the book were printed. Uh, John Smith uh, did Shepherds, and it was much less. Uh, special paper was used. 80 pounds, 11 shillings altogether. It didn't cost very much to register the book at Stationers Hall, but advertisements in newspapers cost quite a lot. And uh, you see that it was, there were uh, over 11 pounds in charges for the London advertisements alone. And then, very interesting, in 1787, around the same time that Dilly's catalog had come out, that I showed you an advertisement from before. At the same time as that, when Boswell was very worried about those books coming out from his competition, uh, Boswell published, or Boswell put out advertisements in the London newspapers that said his book was in great forwardness, uh, very similar to what he, he, he put in the advertisement in Dilly's uh, catalog saying that it was uh, in the press, very similar. Uh, and Dilly didn't forget that, and in this uh, impression account, in 1791, he charges him two pounds, five shillings for the 1787 newspaper advertisements. Boarding 49 copies, those copies that Boswell was giving away, 
49 of them, possibly 48, might have been a mistake, but let's say 49 uh, were going to friends or to others, and uh, they had to be boarded at Boswell's expense. And that was basically just about five pounds. And then little charges for transporting, warehousing, having a helper, you know, all those kinds of things. Dilly didn't forget any of that. He kept all of it. It came to 943 pounds, 16 shillings, four pence. I've estimated that's something like $200,000 today. It's really very difficult to make those kinds of conversions. But just to give you an idea, enormously expensive. And to go back to the, what I was saying before about decisions, Boswell had to make those decisions and say, well, is it worth it to pay essentially 80 pounds to have these illustrations? Are they going to help me sell the book? Is it going to make it a better book? Uh, if, 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 if half the copies had sold, let's just say, uh, by November 1792, Boswell wouldn't yet have received anything. He might have been deeply in the red. Uh, so risk was being taken with all of these expenses. And of course, as the book expanded, as he made it a two-volume book, it required much more paper, and there were greater printing uh, expenses as well. I mentioned before that there was a separate uh, printing uh, uh, record that Henry Bolden uh, gave to Boswell as part of this settlement. And you notice it says, printing your life of Dr. Johnson. So this is not for Dilly. This is for Boswell, because he's the publisher. And this has uh, more detail about the printing, mentioning that it's pica type, uh, mentioning uh, the, the uh, side notes and footnotes, um, mentioning some things at the bottom about the extras, which, um, which I won't go into now. But Boswell was getting all of this information because he was paying. OK. Go back to the beginning. Uh, how can we learn about 18th century books? Boswell's Life of Johnson as a case study. I promised you examples from all of these types of uh, evidence, and I've itemized here what they were. And as a book historian, I think it's important that one goes out, tries to find all of these forms of evidence. You rarely have as much success as I've been able to have with this book because Boswell kept everything and because there were so many advertisements and uh, there was so much correspondence that still exists. Uh, but you get what you can. And then, basically, you try to tell a story. And you make it a human story to the extent that you can. And that's what I've tried to do today. Thank you very much. <laughs>